Okay. So how's DevOps so far? We're a couple days in. All right, so it's going okay, apparently. I see a lot of people, not a lot of noise, though. I'm going to warn you, I ask questions. Um, okay, so real quick, just so I have a, a sense of the room. I have some assumptions, but I want to make sure. So who in the room would classify themselves as a Java developer? That's about what I expected. Um, so most uh, .NET developers in the room? A couple, we've got three, four, okay. Um, which, uh, so how many of you are JavaScript developers? All right, and I like this. So you're a good, you're a good group because most people who classify themselves as a .NET or Java developer don't raise their hand for the JavaScript side because you know JavaScript's this other thing that we do. Um, so, but we, we have to write code in JavaScript. And so, um, okay, one more, two more questions. One more set of questions. Angular developers. React developers. Oh, okay. That's not bad. Um, view? Any view? Oh, I like it. That number gets more and more every time I ask. I, I personally do React right now. Um, I've done Angular and AngularJS. Um, only Angular 2, and they're all the way up to 5 already. Um, okay, so next-gen async patterns in JavaScript. My name is John Mills. I am from here. Um, more specifically, like right there, smack dab in the middle of the United States. So thank you for letting me come uh, and talk to you. We went to Bruges a little bit yesterday afternoon. Absolutely, yeah, nice. That was my response. Um, absolutely gorgeous. <clears throat> All right, so let's get started. JavaScript, unlike .NET or Java or some other language, is by design a single-threaded language. Um, we're not web workers, yes, I know, but we're single-threaded, and that's, that's ultimately the point. And so the struggle that comes with being a single-threaded language is that when you make a call, I assume most of us in the room write call, API calls. Uh, we don't necessarily, I think for this room, we don't necessarily do a lot of file IO, but we at least do a lot of API calls. So that's long running, right? And so we can't block um, the thread. How many of you have ever seen a, a web page where you click a button and it just sits and spins? Right, because it's, it's making a long running call that is blocking the single thread that is available to us. And so what, what JavaScript does to get around this is they have this thing called the event loop. How many of you have heard of the event loop before? I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, I'm just gonna show you a picture of it. That's it, so the event loop ultimately is we've got the stack, uh, that's all of our calls that we're making, and then when we call out to an API of some sort, don't think API like our backend server, just think an API like a JavaScript API, it drops things in this queue, the callback queue. And when the stack empties, the little event loop pulls the next thing off the queue and drops it in the stack and then it executes it. <clears throat> and so the way this works, it's even called the callback queue. Right away, you can see we're going to use callbacks, right? So callbacks are one of these things that we just do. We don't even think about it anymore in JavaScript, right? You just write a little anonymous function, you drop it in there, and they're kind of cool. They look like this. So I make a request out to a, a URL of some sort, and then I create a function that gets called when everything comes back, right? So that's my callback. There I go. However, um, it's not usually this easy. In this case, so I just create a little callback function and now I just have request book URL callback. But how many of you write code that looks like this ever? Like, is it this easy ever, even one time? Almost never because we have to do things with the code that comes back. So in this example, I created a little uh, React application that makes two calls. So it makes one call to, uh, to get a book. So I'm gonna get a book and all the details around that book. It makes a second call 
that has to go get all the related books. I can't go get the related books until I've gotten the books. And I have to wait and I have to do things. And so what we end up with is code that looks like this. We start to nest callbacks. And we call this, I call this anyway, um, Christmas tree code. I don't know if you've heard this phrase before, but you know, because it kind of expands out. Um, I guess we ignore the, the part that comes back in. But um, some people refer to it as callback hell, right? Because it's just one callback after another, after another, after another. They become gross. Named functions, I like to do named functions, and we'll talk about named functions here for just a little bit. Um, but... Name functions don't really help that much because I have a whole lot of stuff that's then embedded in this function. So in this case, if I wanted to name a function, get book and related stuff, I like my function names become gross. So, oh wait, it gets worse. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. This is real, I didn't make this up, this is real. This is um, Google search trends for undefined is not a function. So somebody tell me when Angular became popular. You can tell, it's right there where the spike goes up. And I, I hate to tell you this, I, well I don't, you know this already because you probably contributed to this graph. Um, the results aren't helpful at all uh, because it doesn't know, um, by, by virtue of being undefined, it, it doesn't know how to help you, right? So. Um, we have errors. Your, your API sometimes returns errors, and just errors happen all over the place. So now we have to deal with errors in a callback. How do you deal with errors in a callback? You pass in um, a one function to deal with success, or no, mm. the response will pass one parameter with success, one parameter with error, right? I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, so we do this, function callback error books. Now I have to check error for everything, right? So I go from this to that. Same, same thing, I, it's literally the same code. I just added if statements and now it's gross. Well, it was kind of gross before, but, and I'm not even error handling. This doesn't work. So what they've tried to do in JavaScript, um, so ES6, how many of you use ES6 code? Okay, ES6 native promises. We love promises. Before that you could do promises, but we have promises now. Um, so promises get us started. They start to get us to where we wanna be. Um, they're not all the way there, but they get us there. Basically what happens with the callback is we have incoming and outgoing things embedded in the same function call. Right, and we don't like that. We have in, in vars and out variables and it's just all kind of gross. So we don't like that. What promises do is they separate it. So we have a then now attached. So request book URL, then we're gonna execute this function. It just pulls it apart. Great. There. I am now using promises. And it didn't help that much, right? I mean, so promises, that's obviously not all they do. But I have seen this a lot, which is funny because you go in, you look at somebody's code and they say, hey, yeah, we've made everything promises. And now their code looks worse than it did before. But they're using the, you know, the cool new modern stuff. Okay, so what is a promise? A promise is an object. It's just, a, it's a thing. So don't think about it any other way. It's an object that handles some different function calls. That's all it does. So it's an object that, that handles resolution and rejection of a, an API call or some other thing. And that's literally the only thing it is. We create that just like the return new. So we new up a promise whenever we're, we're writing a function and then we return a new promise. And what the promise does is it takes a function that has resolve and reject, it executes that function. You resolve the promise to, to execute whatever the then is. Because it's an object, that means I can now pass it around. So here I've got my request, request, and my dot then and dot then. This line right here, what is request return? Request returns 
A promise. Excellent. So if a, but a promise is just a thing, right? So I can take that thing and I can move it around. I can hand it to other people. I can pass it around. So I can actually return that promise. Instead of having my dot then right there, I can return that promise and chain my thens. Now it starts to look a little bit nicer, right? So I request the book URL, then I execute a function, then I execute another function. We're getting there. Not quite, but we're getting there. I like this with named functions, that right there. You don't have to care about any of the rest of it, but because I'm returning promises now, I went from this big page of horrible, ugly code to this. Request book URL, then I'm gonna get my related stuff, then I'm going to process my list. That is very easy to read. Except we're forgetting one thing, right? Um, but first, let's, I told you we'd do something real. So this is calling my local API with fetch. So, so fetch is built in in React now, uh, if you do React. I'll do some Angular stuff here in a minute. But um, fetch is basically just, it's gonna go get an API. Then response. So I just do a get book, and that goes and gets that top section, right? <coughs> Here's another thing promises does that's interesting. Notice, then response equals get related response.json. That's kind of gross. It's not really gross, but it's a little gross. I don't want to have to do code related things. What promises let me do is just return anything. I don't have to return a promise from inside of then, I can return anything. So this is a little arrow function that I stuck in there that just says, I'm gonna pass response and I'm gonna return response.json. That's all I'm doing, that's all it does. So I'm dropping this little intermediate piece of code in between my thens to just clean it up a little bit. And then I'm just pulling the book back. I don't have to worry about what JSON is or anything like that. Uh, so it just nicely wraps whatever I return in a promise. It doesn't even matter. So you start to clean things up even more. <sighs> Errors. See, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit ago. Now you pass two functions, okay? Your success function and your error function. That way I don't have all those nasty gross if statements, right? So then success or error. That used to be the way we do it. We don't really do that anymore now. Oh, oh, we reject with an error, but now we just do a dot .catch. Java developers, instead of JavaScript developers, you get, you get comfortable when you get to catch things, right? That just feels more familiar to you instead of having to do if errors. And things. So now we just let you catch your errors. That's much better. So now we end up with this. Can anybody, if, if you just walked in the room, you didn't see any examples, you didn't see anything, you look at this code, and you immediately know what we're doing. Calling a book URL, we're getting related books, I could probably name that better, yes. Um, then I'm gonna process the list and I'm gonna catch errors and I'm gonna handle them somehow. This is promises. Promises are awesome um, and you should be using them if you're not. But I'm now done talking about promises and I have 37 minutes left. So that's like, that's not next gen. That's current, that's where we already are. And hopefully, um, if you're not using promises, you should be getting there. But I kind of wanted to get you up to that point. <sighs> now we're gonna go in two completely different directions because there's two different schools of thought on what um, asynchronous patterns should look like. There's one school of thought that says, kind of like that last slide with promises, I need my code to look clean. I want it to look nice. I want you to be able to follow it easily. I want it to be very readable. And we're gonna go this way. There's another group of people that think promise, uh, that think async calls can be much more powerful. I can add a lot of functionality. I can add a lot of stuff, um, which makes my code much less readable, but much more powerful. 
and they're going to go this way. So I'm going to I'm going to go this way for a second. We're going to talk about some stuff, and then I'm going to come back, and we're going to go completely different direction over here, and we'll see how it works out. Generators. Who uses generators in this room? If I get two hands, I'll be surprised. Ah, oh, I got like six. All right, I love it. I don't know how many of you put your hand up after I said I'd be surprised if I saw two, but that's fine. Um, generators are a new feature. They, they were, for a period of time, my favorite feature in ES6. And the reason they were my favorite feature in ES6 is because they made things much, much easier. But since only like six of you raised your hands, let's talk about generators for just a second. This is a generator function. Notice there's a little star there. Some of you may be cringing right now if you use generators because you want the star to be over next to the function name. It doesn't matter. You can put it in either place. I prefer it there. So a generator function does this. It yields values back. So, so we have a concept of a function that you make a call to the function, the function returns a value, that's it. That's the end of the transaction. We don't do anything more. Generators break this thing. And now you hand something to a function and it returns you multiple things over a period of time, completely differently. Uh, and so that's weird, but it becomes useful in just a second. So in this case, I'm gonna call generator. It's gonna give me two things at two different times. It's gonna give me a message and it's gonna give me the next message. <clears throat> so let's talk through that how that works. I execute it by just executing the generator function and then I go. So in this case, I have a generator, var caller equals gen, it's executed, nothing in my generator has happened yet. I've got this big long generator. Um, the console.log hasn't even executed yet. I call gen.next and it's going to now return something. A whole bunch of stuff happens. One, the console.log executes, and then it returns the message, but it stops right there at yield. What's, what gets returned? Anybody? What is the console.log message? I actually cheated, because now I've told you that it's not quite right. But what's, what's displayed in the console at this moment? Who says message? It's not, but okay, so you get an object, right? So you have a value of message and then a done. So you get an object with the value and whether or not you're done yet. I am not done yet because I have more yields. I haven't exited my function yet. So then it's gonna keep going. I call next again, next message, still not done. Even though I'm at my last yield, it's not done. And then I call it a third time and now it's done with an undefined. <coughs> What makes generators become powerful, and this is how it'll tie into async, I can return the message and then I can pass things back in. So notice here I've got a yield, what is your name? And what gets passed into the next becomes the value of name. So you have this two-way conversation that can start to happen. And this might start to sound very cool when you think about it from an asynchronous perspective. What if I could call something and then just sit and wait. I'm not blocking. We're not making a blocking synchronous call. Everything else around it will still execute, but I can call something and just sit and wait for the response. And then when that generator function is ready, it's gonna pass me something, I'm gonna keep going. That's what we wanna do. Because it kinda all lays out, now we have try catch blocks around all of our, eight, all of our generator code. And that becomes very cool as well, okay. Now let's do this. There is a package called Co. Uh, it's very popular on the Node side, but I've seen people use it, in, use it in React and Angular that takes promises and makes them into generators. So think about that for a second. I now can take anything that's a promise and create something that does this whole yield conversation thing. So what that starts to look like is this, var book equals yield fetch book URL. When book URL returns, 
it's going to assign it to book. Then I'm going to take whatever came back from book and I'm going to yield this dot get related. And now it's related. This code's easy to read. It's easy to follow. I have no nesting, zero nesting at all. I don't have all these additional dot vens. I don't have any of this other stuff. That just works exactly like that. This is great. But I don't have a slide on it, but that's okay. Because it's all synchronous, I can wrap this in a try catch block. That makes it even better. So I can put a try catch, wrap my whole asynchronous, all of my API calls in a try catch block. If anything blows up, I've got one catch down at the bottom and catches everything. That's very cool. But what that gets us is to the point where we're ready for async await. Who uses async await in the room? I have a few. The reason why I said at the beginning that generators were one of my favorite ES6, they were one of my favorite ES6 things, is because now I have async await, which basically replaces all of what, all the cool stuff that generators just were. But some of you can't use async await yet, so you can always use the generator stuff. Async await basically does this. We had this, return, fetch, we have then, we have then, we have all of this stuff. Async await, which is available right now, you could be using it, does this. I create an async function called get book. I await fetch, I await related, I return related. Now, even if we call it await and async, it's still non-blocking, right? So everything inside get books halts execution, but everything else around it still executes. So this becomes very, very simple and very easy, very easy to read. It all just goes. Does that make sense? This, this is the easy stuff, right? This gets us almost to code like we would see on the back end, on, the, on Java, not quite, or .NET, where I just have, I write code and I don't worry about it, it just works, and I can read it, I don't have the nesting, everything's great. That's the first half. This is the easy side. We're gonna go the other way now. And we're gonna talk about observables. How many of you have heard this phrase, observables, before? Okay, <coughs> observables come from the concept of the observer pattern. Uh, gang of four design patterns in the room. Um, if you're interested, I have a gang of four design patterns for JavaScript course out on Pluralsight. I don't know who uses Pluralsight, but, um, which is fun. But uh, the observer pattern basically looks like this. It allows a collection of objects or an object to watch an object and then have something happen when it returns. That's the whole point of an observer pattern. I'm gonna watch you, and when something happens on you, I'm gonna do something. It looks like this, right? So I can pull everything apart. I don't have to have like tight coupling. I can just say, hey, call something when you're ready, right? One object is our focal point, and we just watch for changes. So let's say I have a task. Task is just an object. It's gonna sit there and things are gonna change on task. And then I have a bunch of stuff that needs to know. How many of you ever have to write logging in your systems, right? Or you have to write notification systems or anything else. And you wanna know when something changes in task. So the logging system's looking at task and just says, hey, whenever anything changes, I wanna, I wanna execute. Well, the way this works is that I have a, so my list of observers, Task, once you get to implementation, like all the magic goes away, um, task has just a list of people who are observing. Like it sounds really cool, but then it's, it's an array and a function call, right? That's really all an observer is. So I have a list of people who are observing this task and when something happens, it executes whatever function that thing passed in. We're back to callbacks. And I didn't tell you this earlier, we never get away from callbacks. Like those functions, even though we talked about, they're always going to be there. Uh, <clears throat> so when it's ready, 
it calls and lets us know. What if we did this in async? Think about this for a second. I have an object and I just say, hey, whenever you're done, just call this thing. And then I don't have to worry about it. That sounds remarkably like what we've all been doing. Uh, yeah, just what we've been doing all along, right? That's what we, that's a callback. That's the whole thing. So now I've, I've gone from all this cool stuff and we're now we're back over here. Actually, I was going the other way. We're back over here to, I just have callbacks again, right? Call this thing when you're done. <clears throat> RxJS is the implementation that we use most of the time. Use, not always, but most of the time when we do observables. Who uses RxJS? Okay, good. And you should. Um, RxJS does all this stuff for us. So we don't have the callback, Christmas tree, grossness, and all that stuff. RxJS deals with all of us. And so basically what it does is it creates an observable. Just the observer pattern, it creates this thing that gets watched, and then it deals with everything for us. So this.http.get is how you would do it in RxJS. Um, I'm making my API call. Now I have this thing called an observable. And RxJS is smart because nothing happens here. Because think about it, what if I, I wanna make an API call, but nobody cares what the result is? Should I make the call? No, that doesn't even make sense, right? So <coughs> RxJS pays attention and says, guess what? Nothing's looking, so I'm not gonna do anything yet. The magic starts to happen when we subscribe. So when we say, hey, pay attention to this. So wh when I subscribe, RxJS goes out and starts doing all the stuff. And it goes and it calls, um, calls the HTTP call. When that HTTP call comes back, it calls the function, the callback. I'm sorry, that's what it is. Um, calls the callback and you can do whatever you want with it. What becomes very cool is when we're dealing with errors because we always have errors, right? <sighs> now I just have my dot subscribe and I pass in two functions. This is just like what we had back with promises, right? So I have, here's my data function, here's my error function. And this is the way we're gonna work. And so when does error get called? Either when I get a 500 from an API or I get whatever or something back from my API. RxJS, what becomes cool about it, and because I said there's power, right? We, we're giving up the simplicity that async await had for the power that we would get over here. What RxJS does is it handles failures for us. We can do things like retry. So if something fails, I can retry it. We can go again. Let's see what happens. Um, A subscription is just an object, right? That's all it is. So I, uh, when I do my get with my retry and my subscribe, it returns an object. And I can do things, I can manipulate this object in multiple ways. The first one being, I can unsubscribe. What happens if I unsubscribe from something? If it hasn't made the call yet, is anybody watching? No, RxJS doesn't want to do anything. I can say, never mind. I don't want this anymore. It's been too long, just forget it, we'll move on. Um, so we're not done, that's a misleading slide. I'm gonna alt tab and I'm gonna show you some stuff. Okay, everybody good, read this? It's a huge screen, so I'm not gonna worry too much about making everything bigger. Okay, so what we have here is this is a angular, two, because uh, it's a little older, uh, don't hold it against me, application that basically all it does is it makes the API call, it subscribes, and then what you see here when I refresh is that right here, it makes a call to zero, 
and it gets some stuff. <coughs> Let me introduce you to the other part of this. This is an express, just an express server that when I ever I do a router.get to an ID, I just return that book. So this is what it looks like. This is RxJS. Very simple, very easy, no issues. Right up until we have an error, right? So if I come back over here, and instead of that, I create an error. I now, after one second, I'm gonna send a 500 error. That's all that line of code does, right? If at any point in this demo things don't work, you have to remind me, it's your job, remind me that on the node side, unlike on the Angular 2 side, I have to restart my server. So if I tab and it doesn't work, just somebody yell, restart your server. Uh, so now what happens if I refresh, you will see a 500 error, right? Oh no, I clicked on it. You will see a 500 error pop up right there. Errored, that's bad. And in my console, I'm not doing much with it, but in my console, you see right here, I have error and then my response object, just so you can see it. And that's coming from this line of code right here, right? Execute that error. What happens if I do this? What's it gonna do? How many times is it gonna call? <coughs> three times. Anybody say three? I have two, a couple people who are neglecting to yell as loud as they could because I'm really far away. I don't know if you guys, re like this is a long way. Um, okay, so it's going, let's run it and we'll see what happens. I have to save. Go to network, I'm gonna run this, and you'll see, there's my first one. Error, 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 error. Four times, it called it the first time, and it said, hey, I got an error. I can retry this thing three times. And eventually, it may work. Well, with a 500 error, that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but you could have timing issues, or you, know, you have race conditions, and you could just say, hey, if this thing fails, just try it again. And we'll see, and RxJS just kind of does it for us. What happens when I unsubscribe though? I'm not gonna, I'll take the retry out. What's gonna happen if I unsubscribe? Just completely unsubscribe. It's gonna cancel the request, that's absolutely right. So let's try this. I'm just gonna unsubscribe right away. Okay, so it's gonna cancel the request. Let me ask you this. How many requests is it going to make? Well, I took the retry out. So your options are really zero or one. But, ah, right. Because, I don't know, um, it should really make one. Even though it looks like I'm, I'm unsubscribing right away, like I should get in before it makes the call. It actually does go ahead and make the call. But here's what's interesting. So if I refresh, you'll see I get to my zero and I get canceled. I didn't get my 500 error back, I just got canceled. Let's look at this on the other side because that becomes weird. I'm gonna take my unsubscribe out and I'm gonna go to my server. There you'll see my call and my 500. If I come back over here, I refresh, there's my call and my 500 error. So I am serving back 500s. Now you said it's gonna cancel the request. So what that means is it actually will send to the server a cancel. It says, never mind, I don't need this anymore. And so what that looks like is if I come back in here and I put my unsubscribe back in, Look at what happened. 
I didn't send a 500 back. Just in case you don't believe me, I'm going to refresh. I don't send a 500 back. It actually physically cancels the request on the server. It sends a... Now, in this case, this is Express, and I don't know anybody, any Node Express developers. Okay. Express just handles this for me on its own. Doesn't matter. Um, and that, that becomes very cool because I don't need to worry about it. The problem is I'm still executing code. Like, right... I'm sending, here I'm sending res.send status 500. I'm sending the error message back, but Express just says, no, you're not. I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? So what we can do is actually just say, hey, I'm going to cancel on close. When, if that connection is closed, just never mind. I'm going to, I can clean up, I can halt long running execution, I can do whatever I want. And now, if I cancel this and start over, and I make my request again, you'll actually see canceled. Like it knows, hey, you're canceled. So I can put hooks in here on my API that says, look, they don't need this anymore. Let's just stop execution. Let me show you one more thing with this. <coughs> what if I unsubscribe later? So in this case, after two seconds, I'm going to unsubscribe. I've got to, for, in order for that to make sense at all, I have to put the retry back in. Because I don't, I don't know that I'm canceling right away, right? I'm, I'm going to wait a while and we're going to see what happens. And then eventually I'm going to unsubscribe and just go. So when I do this, what you're going to see here is you'll actually see a zero and a 500 come back, a zero and a canceled. So it allows that call to go through, but then it'll come back and it'll cancel later on, which is cool. <coughs> Because on the back end, you kind of see that same thing. Well, let me clear that. I'll run it again, and then I'll kind of show you. Here we get our 500. Oh, and then the second one was canceled. Notice it on close only executes if it's, if it's a hard cancel. So this is RxJS. Not this. This is Express. This is RxJS. And RxJS is powerful. It gives you cancelable API calls. It gives you retryability. It gives you all of these things. The code is not, notice I didn't make it, I didn't add another subscribe for the second call and all these other things because it becomes kind of gross and I wanted to be able to focus, right? So I'm giving up the beauty, the beauty, the cleanliness of async await for the power that is RxJS. And you kind of have to pick the piece that you want and go with the thing that makes most sense for what you have. And that's kind of how we're going to close out. We're going to close out this way. So we've come a long way from callbacks, right? I mean, so RxJS and async await, async await is within the last, it's been ready just within the last year. Right? I mean, it's, it's gone through the process and it's been around for a while, but, it, but it's been available for us to use really only within the last year. And promises have only come around really in the spec approved since 2016, right? So those of us who have been writing JavaScript for way longer than that, um, remember the jQuery days, right? And we've come a long way in async from pure callbacks all the way to async await or RxJS. However, think about it this way. These are just tools in your toolbox, right? It's not, hey, I always do RxJS or I always do promises or I always do async await. You're, once you know what all of the options are and you kind of see them laid out, it's when you get to a specific problem that you're trying to solve. Hey, I have all of this buried stuff and it's gross and I can't read my code. Async await starts to make sense. 
or hey, I have this API that fails randomly and I just need to try it again, or I need to, I have long running stuff that I need to cancel, now RxJS makes sense, right? You have to pick the tool that makes the most sense for the thing that you're doing right now. Don't pick just one, sometimes you go with all of them or you go with none of them, you know, whatever makes sense for you. Um, use the right one <coughs> for your situation. All right, so I have some time left for questions. I'm not going to hold everybody hostage for questions. So if you have questions, come down and, and chat with me. I left a little bit of time. Otherwise, thank you guys very much. Uh, have a great rest of DevOps.